Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna try a different one now. Let me see how this one work, if it works. Okay, Stephen, let me try a different thing. I went heavyweight now, I went heavyweight. And if it doesn't work on the heavyweight, well, I don't know what to say. We're, we're gonna see if this heavyweight works today. This is the heavyweight version which I'm putting in. Um. Ha! Ah. Ha! Ha! Got you! I put on the heavyweight. <laughs> I went heavyweight a while ago, man. There's always a way, Stephen. Yeah. All right. So let me let me try and sort the lighting out behind me. I think I think it's my daughter came in the room and made the heavyweight. You know. <laughs> Hold on. <clears throat> Don't worry. Is that <laughs> Steve? I don't I don't mind this, you know. At least I can hear you and see you. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you clearly. I can hear you live and direct. We can we can all oh, hear yeah. you. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't know if you could hear me or not. Tell you what, 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 you do what you're doing there while you're doing housekeeping. Yeah, I'm just trying to sort um, the lighting out. Yeah, that, that's all right. You, you, you do what you're doing there. Um, because we, it's a good thing we, we did our test um, earlier, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you, you do what you're doing there, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, um, thanks for those who were hanging around while we were there practicing and trying to get this thing going. Um, yeah, see me. You're, you're, you're okay. You can see me, yeah. Yeah, can you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well, very well, very well, and okay. very well. Um, well, um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for coming on tonight and. Uh, uh, you, a few of you have, have been on and see something happening. I don't know what is happening there, you know. Well, I always like to practice a bit before I bring on guests sometime because there can be some little hiccup. So we, we in hindsight, I, I said, let's, Steve, let's try to practice, do a little quick run. And, uh, and by our perseverance, and this is a crucial thing, by our perseverance, we were able to break through. I had to go heavy duty. On on this on the Wi-Fi and Facebook, I went heavy duty. I, you know, you saw you saw the phone I, phone call I made up to Mark. You saw the, the call I made to Mark Zuckerberg a while ago. You see me? Yes. <laughs> I had to call Mark Zuckerberg, man. I just sort it out, Mike. You know. <laughs> um, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, Stephen Akinsania is a barrister and a defense counsel, and he's got a lot of cases where he um, represent. Um, young people, you know, uh, boys, girls, whatever, in issues of knife and gun crime. And uh, one of the reasons why I, I said to, let's keep the discussion going. Some people sometimes say it's too heavy and, and uh, we talk too much about it, but I believe it's very important to keep a spotlight on this because uh, of late, I've done two summits where Stephen partnered with us on called the Solution Oriented Summit. 
whereby we discuss issues regarding knife and gun crime. It's like a, a platform, creating a platform for, for effective um, discourse. And, uh, and I, just, I just let you guys hear something which is in the pipeline, which is very powerful. I gave Stephen a synopsis of this earlier. Um, and, I think, and, I, and I think this is, this is something which is, which is very good. So let's listen up for a second, um, if I can get it going. Creating a platform for effective discourse, seeking yeah, solutions. And on this episode of The Sylvan Show, the Solution Oriented Summit, creating a platform for effective discourse, seeking solutions and impacting actions, tackling knife and gun crime in our community. Let it not be our legacy. With your host, Sylvan Sidiel and Stefan Gislain, with... Yisrael Emmanuel on the King's Peace Treaty. Stephen Akinsanya on Court and Youths. Charles Kieran on what it is to be a man and a father. Reverend Ezekiel Thompson on loving your city. Do you love your city? Cherry Johnson on the impact of social media and county lines. Rachel Okello on youths and deportation. Paula Perry on early development and poverty. The Jamaican High Commissioner of the UK, His Excellency Mr. Set George Romacan, from the High Commission perspective. Leila Thomas of early Urban Synergy. And poverty. Right, so ladies and gentlemen, what you've seen there is that we, we have done a few shows and, um, and there have been some wealth of information, very powerful information, and what we're going to be doing is releasing those on different shows. And you can hear that's the, the voiceover, which is there. Um, so without further ado, let me just invite Stephen. And um, Stephen, how are you this evening? Yes, I'm well. I'm well, apart from our connections issues, uh, which we've now overcome. But uh, yeah, I'm very well, Sylvan. Thanks for inviting me on. Yes. You know, Stephen, um, this evening I went down to Catford. Um, I live in Catford and, uh, and I saw Street tapered off. And, and it's when I went somewhere, they said, ah, there's been some stabbing of a 50 year old man who got stabbed and killed um, four o'clock this morning. And, uh, and then they said it was a third person within 24 hours. And that did not include the four stabbings of those boys in Camberwell. Um, you know, and there were about 30 young men or so, 30 young people running all over the place that the police, they reported that the police were even somewhat distressed by what they were seeing as well. And one of the boys, they say, were disemboweled, dis disemboweled, disemboweled, if that's the right word, you know? Stephen, what's going on? What's going on out there? We all I don't know. I mean, I, I, was, ex <laughs> I was extremely angry uh, when I heard the news the other evening uh, on, on a day when young people were receiving A-level results having worked extremely hard to go on to the next stage of their education. And then I hear the news at 5.30 in the evening, young people running around with knives, two, I think two or three boys seriously injured, uh, yeah. talked uh, by witnesses of a young man being disemboweled. I don't know what people, if people know what that means, but it, it's something that's very gruesome uh, in yeah. cases I've seen similar things where people's intestines are hanging outside of their body after they've been stabbed. Wow, wow. Uh, the time for, there's been a lot of talk, but there's now a need for real action. And that action is across the board from uh, us in the community, right up to our politicians, uh, the mayor, the prime minister, because we, we're busy worrying about things that are happening on the international scene and we have young people dying on our streets as if it's a war zone. And it's unacceptable. Yes, yes. yes. Now, it, it, it is something which has um, been going on for a while, but somehow there seems to be a, a level of consistency in regards to whereby you go through a period, they don't hear anything or you think it's all sorted, and then waboom, you realize, hang on a second, this is actually... Uh, the process or the con it is very consistent in a certain way. And Leroy Logan, the former commander of the police who have been on our um, last summit in, um, in Grove Park, he said, Silburn, and this is not really the, the, the summer yet, you know, the summer is just really kicking in for the holidays, you know. 
and I, and I think the key thing now is regarding solutions. Yes, indeed. Uh, as I say, there's been too much talk. Uh, I've been very disappointed by uh, those who purport to represent the interests of the community. Um, the mayor, for me, has not been active uh, enough. Um, calling together um, power brokers and big wigs to have a discussion is not going to solve this. It needs yeah. people on the ground coming up with real solutions now, immediately, uh, yeah. to stop this level of knife crime, which is unprecedented. And that, by that, I mean tackling it at grassroots levels, going into schools, yes. actively going into schools. It requires a, a look into uh, those communities and areas where this is happening. So, for example, yes. in a lot of housing estates, there needs to be, in my view, uh, superintendents and more presence of a local community police and police officers uh, who the community can go to and they can also monitor those who are criminally active. Yes. It requires uh, more input uh, with community centers, uh, referral units. There's a wealth of issues that need to be tackled in order to stop our young people thinking it's okay to carry a knife either in self-defense or to use it to stab somebody else. And so the time for talking has to yeah. stop we need to be active now. Yeah. Um, if, if you can sort of go back a bit and sort of elaborate um, as to your, the, the level of work that you do in the courts um, and just shed a light yeah. a bit on the sort of experience that you have with defending some of these young men out there, Stephen. Right. Well, I mean... You know this, Sylvan, from the conversations we've had before. When I started 25 years ago yeah. uh, practicing as a barrister, I was regularly used to defending adults charged with uh, a, a, an array of criminal um, offences. Yes. But in recent years, my practice comprises of defending children, uh, children yeah. as young as 12, charged with murder, attempted murder, grievous bodily harm with intent, uh, and I've, I, I've just become appalled uh, with the, the way in which young people are regularly passing through Crown Courts, not even Magistrates Court, yes. Crown Courts for trial in front of a jury, 12 men and women who don't even know these young people. They're surrendering their, the rest of their lives effectively in the hands of 12 people. And invariably, these young boys are being convicted of murder attempted murder and they are getting the mandatory sentence and a lot of people don't understand that you know if you're committing these sort of offenses with knives even as a youngster of age 12 or 13 you're liable to get the minimum term of 12 years in prison that's the minimum term and i through my experience of defending young men most recently a, a murder a six-handed murder uh, five or five-handed murder five boys charged with murder appearing at st albans crown court and it was the fastest verdict I have seen in all my career for a trial that yeah. ran for six weeks and five young men were convicted in less than four hours of murder where only two of those boys could have actually inflicted uh, the wounds that caused the death of a young man with, an, with a knife or two knives. But all five went down for murder and the sentence hearing, uh, my client particularly, who was the person who they said was responsible for the stabbing, received the sentence of 14 years in prison, age 15. Yes, yes. Wow. Wow. And people that, don't that... understand. They don't understand you know, the, the, the issue of joint enterprise, which often leads to a number of people appearing in court for something that they weren't actively involved in. They don't understand the minimum term. That means you have to serve not half of a sentence, but you have to serve at least 12 years before... Yeah. Uh, the uh, parole board consider your release. They don't understand what yeah. goes on in court when I have to go down to the cells when these boys have been convicted and the bravado that one sees on the streets is taken over by screams and wails for their loved ones. The atmosphere in yeah. the courtroom where you have the deceased mother sitting in one corner of the courtroom and then the, the parents or the mothers invariably of the boys 
who have committed the offence, all in the same courtroom, and you're hearing the tragic outcome of a young man who's no longer here to have dinner with his family, and the, the tragic outcome of, of a young boy who will not have dinner with his family for at least 14 years. Yes. And this is what needs to go out. The message needs to go out to schools, to, to the young people on the street who think it's cool to carry a knife or there are no consequences. The life-changing uh, uh, the life-changing injuries that people receive, young people who have to have colostomy bags because their intestines are being cut out. This is the reality of what I see every day. So, 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 so it, it is like it is like Stephen that somehow it is not being registered uh, to people because okay, okay, somebody will will say, well, the, the Cressida decree said to say gang crimes or whatever is going down or being stabilized. If you remember, you heard that recently. Somebody may yeah. make a comparison with Chicago and say, well, in Chicago, 30 people got shot in one night, you know what I'm saying? You know? But for the UK, when I think about 30 young children, 13, 14, 15, out there at 5.30, a friend of mine in Netherlands said, uh, don't you guys have a curfew? Maybe they need to have a curfew in the night. And I said, no, Julian, it's 5.30 in the afternoon. And someone just mentioned a while ago proposing an immediate sort of, uh, sort of curfew thing. But where are the parents? Where are the parents in this situation? Well, I mean, this sort of thing, this thing happened at 5.30. Now, arguably, parents have to go to work. And it's yes. tough for a lot of these parents who are literally having to work every hour just to keep a roof over the family's head. Yes, so there yes. has to be a responsibility of knowing where your children are, what they're doing, who they're associating with, uh, because how can this be happening at 5.30 in the afternoon? We, yes. we, people are witnessing this going on. It's, it, it's a sense of lawlessness. I, I don't understand. And yeah. there has to be a level of accountability where we are asking the question, why are these young people at that age out socializing in the way that they do or, 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 or meeting the kind of individuals that they meet. But someone has to start asking the really hard questions and it has to begin at home with the family. Because after all, yeah. these young people go somewhere to sleep. I assume they go home to sleep somewhere. They go home to eat somewhere. They have a family. And we have to have a level of honesty where we say we have to be accountable for our young people. Fathers who are not mm. active in their children's lives, step up. Mothers who yes. can't control their children, step up. Relatives who see their children going the right, step up. Because we as a community have to own it before we then start making complaints about issues such as stop and search uh, uh, and, 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 and police brutality and racism. We need to own these issues first. Yes. Right. So, so okay. I'm just making some notes here because one of the things that we always talk about is that we can have conversation upon conversations and uh, and it, it finishes with a nice conversation. And one of the first things you said right there, and I'm writing this down here, um, we must own the situation or the problem first. We. And you, the word you said, we. Now, my children are not involved in anything. Your children, I know of you, is not involved. But you use the word we. Stephen, Stephen, we. Does that we yeah. mean everybody? Go for it, yeah. Yes, because I believe in the old African proverb that it takes a village to raise a child. And so some children are not as fortunate as your children or my children who have the nuclear family with mum and dad present, involved, knowing what's going on, asking the right questions, having barriers where they stop their children, your children going to certain places, fraternizing with certain people. Some children do not have those safety valves. So we as a community need to get involved. It's okay to say, well, I'm all right, so it's nothing to do with me. But yes, I work on the premise that none of us uh, are better than anyone else. And the things that, the tragedies, and I call it the tragedies that be befall other families could equally happen to me and my family your family. Yeah. So that's why we need to own this as a community. That's why I go into schools. 
I could take the view that I'm a, I'm a successful lawyer. My children go to good schools. I live in a nice area. I don't see these things happening around me. So therefore, it's nothing to do with me. But it is something to do with me because those could be my children. And often I see these young people that I represent as my children. And even in the work that I do, I try and encourage them. I try and take them under my wing because I believe that we need to own this problem. We need to own it as a community that people always refer to the yeah. community. What does the community mean? The community means people willing to get involved, people willing to roll their sleeves up and say, enough's enough. I want to help. I want to do something. Right. Giving young people hope, opportunities, opportunities to show them a different way of life rather than the fast life of peddling 10 pound bags of cannabis, thinking you're going to be a millionaire. Yes, yes. That's a yes. community issue. Being right, so empowered, like other communities, the Asian community, the Jewish community, the Chinese community, we need to empower ourselves. We need to look mm. up for our youngsters and show them there's a different way that amongst people in our community, there are the professionals, the tradesmen, the people who are earning a decent living, doing hard work, providing for their families with career plans and goals. Not living the quick, fast life, peddling drugs and then getting a criminal record, which means you can't travel. You're limited with the employment you can get. You become incarcerated. All the things that people don't want to talk about. And that's why I refer to we. And that's why I refer to owning it. When we own it, then we can confront the other issues that we all know exist, such as racism, police brutality. All of that can be addressed. But until we, as a community, own these issues, we're going nowhere. And we will continue to see in the newspapers daily, because the press likes to sensationalize how many black kids are killing black kids. They don't tell you about the black kids who are going to Oxford and Cambridge, who are graduating yeah. daily, the kids who are working in the city, in the square mile. They don't write about that because it's not and, popular. Yeah. But what's popular and, is the young yeah. black kids, feral, killing each other like animals. And, and as well, uh, 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 Stormzy just made a, uh, an offer of giving uh, two young people um, scholarship to go to Oxford. It's there in the papers, but it's just in the backside there, really. It's not a, a big thing for the press. I, I do recall, remember when the, the, the gentleman, the, 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 the travelers, actually burgled, um, well, my neighbor, around the corner there, and, they act, and, they, and, the, and my, my neighbor stabbed the guy and killed him. And he, of course, everybody knows now, he has moved out of the area and everything like that. But the press, the press was in the area every day. And as a neighborhood watch coordinator, I had to go up there and say, come on, guys, there's a war between the community and the travelers, you know? But the press was just looking for that information. They, they, they want to sensationalize it. And, and, and because before that happened, Stephen, there were the spate of killings with black boys. So they were trying to even link it. So, so and, yeah. and, 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 that's, and that's the whole thing, which is so crucial, whereby... The, the solutions and some of the things which have been talked about, the press can play a fundamental role. Because you know the press. The press can take down a government <laughs> when they coordinate themselves. Oh. The, the press can actually make a fundamental Because as I say, the press can actually, you know, the Rupert Murdoch, they talk about, they actually change. They, they, they make opinions as well. And I think they play a good role. But if they're not with us, we have to actually be the ones, actually, that change the game, change the narrative as well. Yeah, that's 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 my view, uh, because it, it's so easy. People like to read bad news. And most people I talk to, uh, when they talk about knife crime in London, they invariably say, yeah, but it's young black boys killing young black boys. Yeah. Uh, and, and the reality is, if you look at the numbers, it's true. Uh, the press wants to report that. They don't want to report the good news. So what do we need to do? We need to take that bad news and try and fix it. Yes. And I have asked you this question. Uh, the, most of the cases and most of the killings are, are black and black, yes? Uh, in court, without divulging your sensitivity of your cases, predominantly, is that the case as well? Yes. Right. It's a fact. Right. Every, every single yeah. case that I have done involving young people mm. charged with murder, 
has involved black youths either killing black youths or being the victim of murder. And it's often related to cannabis supply in areas fighting for control of postcodes. Fact. Wow, wow. It's interesting you mentioned the term fighting for postcodes. Uh, someone posted something is that most of these boys, even their families sometimes don't even own a home for themselves to a certain extent in these areas which they are claiming for postcodes and, and, and somewhat seeking a, a particular zone. So therefore, your child, my child, maybe one day we're getting them to um, going out there on the road. They, they're going to another area. I mean, it's, it, it's, that's scary. It's, it's, that's really scary. Of course it's you scary. Know? And that's one of the reasons why with my children, I don't let them go to certain places. Fact. Yes. I, yes. yeah, I live close to Croydon. My sons do not go to Croydon. I will not allow it. And that's a shame. I grew up in Croydon. I grew up in Thornton Heath. I've been in this area for near on 50 years. Wow. But I don't know what's happened. And, and, and part of my anger, Silbon, is that for someone like me who loves history, when I look at the great black figures in history, when I think about my parents who came here in the late 50s, early 60s, and their contribution to this country, Neat, countless others who came. When I think about the great black struggle with, 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 with civil rights in America, what are our young people doing murdering each other on the streets of London for what? It makes me mad that they don't even know their own history, but they're prepared to kill each other because someone's looked at someone funny or you're not in the right area or you're wearing some some item of clothing that you think you deserve deserve what the hell is happening I, yeah. I i just get so angry that is life that cheap i don't get, look you could go to the the, the the worst places in the world some of the most war-torn places in the world and people don't behave this way yes yes so what is happening on the streets of modern britain london where our young people are carrying zombie knives horrible knives and disemboweling each other. For what? I don't know what sparked the issue uh, last week in Camberwell. No doubt we'll find out in due course. But what mm. on earth is going on? And if our government and if our mayor cannot see how serious this is happening in London. I was in London today in the South Bank with tourists. And I was thinking to myself, but two or three miles from here, we've got carnage on our streets. Yes. It should not be happening. And we need to stop it. And the mayor can have meetings, and but until he recognizes that we need to start dealing with things immediately. So immediately yeah. going into school, immediately looking at why children are being excluded from schools, going to referral units. What's happening in the referral units? Mm. A proper collaboration between the government and, and, and the judiciary about how we perhaps impose even stiffer sentences for those who are appearing in courts for these type of offences, so that at least the message is clear that if you choose to behave in this way, there is condign punishment. And I'm saying this as a defence lawyer all my career. Yeah. But the way in which people are behaving as if they have no regard for the law, no regard for the people they live amongst, the people who have to view this with their children. I watched one man say that he was moving out of Camberwell. He was moving his family because he doesn't want his children growing up in that kind of environment. Mm. What the hell is going on? And, and, and you mentioned a while ago that about in, in, in the judicial system and the, the sentencing, do you, do you see or, or believe that the sentencing which is, ha which is being imposed on these gangsters or even these murderers or whatever, this, I'm hearing that they're seeing prison as a holiday camp. It's like they get stars. It, it's, it's something like a trophy. They don't, it is not like a punishment, really. Well, I'll tell you this, Silver. All the murder cases I've done, when the judge pronounces sentence to a young man who had all the swag and all the bravado during the court proceedings, waving to his friends in the public gallery or messing around in the dock with his co-defendants, the recent case I did, when the verdict came in in less than 
four hours. There were audible screams from the dock by certain defendants who were yeah. petrified that they'd just been convicted of murder. Yeah. And on the sentence day, when the judge pronounced sentence of 12 plus years to each and every one of them, there were tears. When I went down to the stairs at the old Bailey, when I went downstairs at the old Bailey to the cells, I could hear sobs. The look of fear on my client's face when I actually had to explain to him that 14 years meant 14 birthdays, 14 Christmases, not seven, not half. So mm. those who think it's a trophy, they're idiots. Because yeah. you ask yourself, what are you going to be doing in 14 years' time? Could you even envisage 14 years from now? Now, even to those who say, well, I've got nothing to live for, I don't buy it. There's no bravado when you're serving 14 years in prison. Just think about, can anyone envisage next summer what they're going to be doing in August 2019? Will you try and envisage 14 summers times what you're going to be doing? There's no bravado in serving 14 years in prison, I tell you. And I've been to all the prisons, from Feltham all the way up. Wow, wow, wow. The... the... The bit which took place, like in Camberwell, which I understand it was on a housing estate, and uh, and sometimes these things are in particular areas, inner city areas, where there's a sort of build-up. What do you think should happen on these estates? Should there be some, like a, a police outpost or some mediation hub or something? Because there's always, um, a, a, you know, disrespect. Disrespect is one of the fundamental things. You disrespect. And then, then, then there sometimes things are like misunderstanding or so. You know, people. I can't remember who it yeah. was. Hmm. Yeah, please, I can't please, remember please. who it was. Said, um, "George, or not war, war." And to me, dialogue is so important. And I've learned that through my practice of talking to people who ordinarily would come across as hardened criminals, but when you engage with them, when you articulate with them. You try and find yeah. out what the issues are and build up a dialogue. Then you build up trust. And for me, yes. in certain areas, and I think I said this to you, that I remember when I used to travel to New York regularly um, back in the early 80s, 90s, and certain parts of Brooklyn and Bronx in some of these projects, as they called them, they had a super, superintendent. And he was like yes. the eyes and the ears of the block. And people could go to him and they trusted the super. Uh, and if there yeah. were issues, the super would know. And he had a good relationship with the local police. And uh, yeah. you know, I think the, the time has come. And, and it all, I'm afraid, boils down to the economic decisions that are made by the mayor and ultimately the government. Ultimately, do lives of young people, whatever color, creed, whatever they are, do they matter? Because yeah. if young people are dying at the rate that they're dying in the streets, the government has to address these issues and stop using excuses. You have to spend the money. We're happy to spend money on foreign aid to the extent where we're sending millions to countries who effectively have their own nuclear program. We're happy yeah. to spend money uh, on funding all sorts of ridiculous causes. They were happy to spend millions, if not billions, to ensure that they got back into power by doing a deal with, with, with the Irish political party. But we can't spend money in London to ensure that young people are not dying. And it's an economic decision. Because if the money's being spent to put more police on the beat, to know who's who, stopping people who they know are known suspects who carry weapons or are involved in criminality, having the funding to put into community centers for young people who don't have the support at home to go so they can interact with people who are trained in this area to get to the nub of their issues, yeah. giving them hope, apprentice programs, all of this has been cut. And for those people who cannot go to Oxford and Cambridge, those people who cannot aspire to do, become doctors and lawyers, you have to give them some form of hope because if you don't, Peddling drugs and making quick money on the street to buy those trainers to give you that lifestyle, which YouTube or the videos telling you you can have too, it's going to result in more and more crime. So someone needs to get real and stop dancing around the issue and yeah. spend the money where it needs to be spent. Because um, there's a Sheila Crab which just said, what do these teenager, teenagers get from their gang? 
friends that they are not getting from their families, are they looking for a sense of belonging, community, and will risk their lives or liberty to get it? The only way to find out is to talk. Difficult conversation with gang members, victim, and such a perhaps. You know, Paul McKenzie, who we sat on the panel with at the first summit there, uh, he does a lot of work with talking to these guys, these gangsters. Some, some of them he's vis visible, visibly moved that he had to just shut down the interview because of the sort of um, Brazil way, how they just do what they're doing. And then the question put to them, would you let your child or your son do what you're doing? And instantly they say, no way, you know what I mean? No way. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, that tells and, you that and, tells you all you need to know. Yeah, and 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 Cherry John's Cherry, um, who came on the show the other day at, at the Crystal Palace Park, she talked about the counter line. They talk about the youths are actually going missing. They are not missing, but they're missing from their parents. But you know, Paul did another video about uh, buying the young boys and chicken and chicken and chicken, and then all of a sudden. They are, they are saying, you are actually bonded to us. You are now actually, you owe us. So what you can deliver these jugs or whatever like that. So I think the question has to be now is what is it in the psyche of the young people that allow them to be easily persuaded? And it's Martin, a combination of factors. And not all the young people. Just yeah. Just, yeah, yeah, not all the young people. But those who are, yeah. it's a, a sense of wanting to belong. Uh, and if you don't invest time with your child or spend time with your child or give them a sense of purpose or hope or, or even encourage them, yeah. then if you don't do it, they'll go out elsewhere to find it. And often if in certain areas where uh, these young people live, uh, the street becomes their friend, those who are already in that lifestyle. And when you see the way that they're living, and in fact, when I go back to the case I just did, one of the young men said, yes, I'm a gang member. And the reason why I became a gang member, because I was making 700 pounds a week yeah. doing, doing their bidding by selling, selling weed and running errands and, and hiding knives. I was making money. And 700 pounds for a 15 year old is a lot of money. You know, some people mm -hmm. don't earn that a month. And so when you're earning that kind of money, uh, and you think you're invincible, and you think that you're going to go on earning that ad infinitum, then you're going to carry on in that lifestyle till you either get caught or till you end up dead or you end up in prison. And so the whole psyche has to change, the whole mindset of what it means to be a parent, whether you're a single parent or, or, or a nuclear family, what it means to raise a child, mm -hmm. to invest time in your children, to know where your yeah. children are, to have accountability. You know, it's part of, for me, part of this liberal society where there are no rules. There's no accountability. People can do what they like. But there will always be consequences when you have that kind of free will. When they say everything goes, everything goes. It's yeah. Right. So, if, so if, if you are to look at some key um, pointers, I mean, this is an area where people have been talking about for uh, youngs. Uh, it regurgitates itself. Some of the discussions which are happening, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, even I'm guilty as well, we have been there before. <laughs> and and we, we come back with the same narrative. We come back with the same problem. We come back with the same hearing from the mother, hearing from the, gangs, the former gangster, hearing from the police. But what, as you said, is not happening is the immediate action to deal with this? Should there be more stiffer sentences, some zero tolerance, more hardcore stop and search? Some well, I think we're entering the realm where that at some point is going to be necessary because we cannot have young people running around with knives at 5.30 in the afternoon on the streets of London thinking it's okay to have a little war of their own, stabbing each other up, disemboweling each other, and to not say enough's enough. Someone's grieving. Someone in a, someone's in a hospital night uh, this evening, standing yeah. at a hospital bed, waiting to see whether their son recovers. Yeah. That's the reality of it. And so there's an element of zero tolerance. There's an element of that for sure. But there's equally, and perhaps more importantly, getting to the grassroots of why this is happening and not having yet another debate 
about knife crime. It's about actively saying, what are we going to do? Who are we going to engage to do this? And let's talk yeah. to the real people, not make it some political showdown or some political stunt. Let's talk to the real people. In my little world that I operate in, I spend my life defending people. That's what I do. I try and mentor people. I've had mentors for over 10 years. So I take a few yeah. people under my wing to show them a different way, to encourage them, yeah. to build them up, to tell them that you can be whatever you want to be. Maybe they've yes. never even heard that before. So in my world, that's what I do. And if each of us was prepared to roll up our sleeves to get involved, there are so many organizations already. Let the mayor, let the government speak to the right people who are at grassroots level who have the real ability to have impact where it needs to have impact and not just have someone turn up in a suit talking rubbish. Get yes. to deal with the right people who are on the ground, going into the school and spend the money. Spend the money where it needs to be spent and stop talking about cuts. Yeah. Because until we don't do that, until we address these issues in that way, Tomorrow's headlines already being written. Yes. All they got to do is just put up the same template there. Maybe they got these template there, whereby people are just yeah. covering the, the nook and the cranny of the UK, looking for these different things. Nana Marco just said, "We're living in a loop. It's like we're living in a loop. It's it's a it's a deja vu. It is a, it's keep happening every day. You wake up in the morning." Uh, and the first thing you see, another stabbing, another knife crime. And then it becomes the top news on the, the news, LBC, BBC. What is that name? The stabbing in Catford there, the stabbing in Camberwell. There's a, a lady who was on, I think it's X Factor or Pop Idol or something with the nurses or something like that, got killed, you know? It's like a knife is so easy, you know? But then, but then knives are so quick to, easy to access then, isn't it? Of course. It's the weapon of choice. Yeah. Right. So, so what, what, what next, Stephen? What next? I mean, as I said, we, we talk about owning the problem first, getting the right people on board, the people who are out there and they just want to get going. I know a lot of young guys, lots of ex-gangsters, lots of persons working in the community. Um, you might have heard I said there's over 25 or so organizations which have num if, um, information on. And then I went to another event and they said there are a couple hundred alone in Lambeth <laughs> dealing with the whole issue. And therefore, it seemed to be that there need to be a more cohesive organization or coordination of different um, um, persons that are working in, in this area. Going into the school, as you said, I think that is one of the key ones. Going into the school, which is a key hub, whereby um, the, the minds are very impressionable from early days laying it out straight, whether they like it or not, laying out the whole issue. They are quick They are quick now. They are quick now. If a child says, uh, years ago, you got a boy, you know, a girl like climbing trees. If a girl goes like that, they want to change their sex so quickly. And they pump so much money into that, Steve. A child is confused and need to understand what's going on in their life instead of actually point to the child the right way the, what, what, what do you want to be what do you want to be child there, there's, there's, this, there's this favorite joke about a pastor a, 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 a banker and a lawyer and they asked, they asked the pastor how much is one on one the pastor said one on one is two till thy kingdom come they asked the accountant what is one on one he says two it could be three depends on appreciation depreciation and they asked the lawyer how much is one on one and the lawyer says, how much you want it to be? <laughs> the point I'm putting right there, the point I'm putting right there is that they're not asking children to determine their sex. They're asking children, what is it that you want? That guiding principle, that guiding light, which was there by the adults, the parents, are now being taken away against Stephen. And therefore, you've got persons with pervasive mindset, persons with warp thinking now, writing policies, even TED Talk, TED Talk the other day talked about pedophilia as something normal. TED Talk, platforms which are created. So what, what, so what do we expect to be happening then 
if the powers that be and the key influencers are not being that guiding light? Steve? Well, I mean, this is part of the problem that instead of focusing on real issues, we're allowing a certain element of our society who are not even directly affected by the issues that we're talking about yes. to start implementing policies that really have no place, in my view, have no place in a young person's curriculum. The money that they spend on these things, they should be spending on those areas I've already talked about. Mm. It's a, for me, it's an economic decision. What price of a life, these young lives that are just being taken away, unfulfilled dreams ending up in the graveyard or locked in prison, there must be a reason. And if it means there's issues or there are issues in school, we address them. If it yes. means that there are parents who are not equipped to raise children properly, we address them. Yeah. If it means that the criminal justice system needs to be tightened up, we address it. And if it means that we have to spend more money doing it, well, let's do it. This is the country where we live. Yes. Why yes. are we sending millions to arm for other countries' nuclear programs and we can't address young people being stabbed in the, in the capital city? It's a nonsense. But because of politics, yes. people making decisions that suit them or the yes. political agenda. So I ask the question, what price of the lives that we're losing on the streets? And dare I say it, people talk about black lives. Well, do they matter? Mm -hmm. Black children are not the only ones who are being murdered. But I guarantee you, if this kind of behavior was happening in Windsor, in Berkshire, yes. I, doubt, I doubt we would have the delay no. of addressing these issues. But ironically, it's unlikely to happen in Windsor, Berkshire, because it happens to be quite a... a, a, a a nice place to live yes. for most people but this is happening in our major cities and until these issues are addressed at grassroots level it yeah. will continue and so oh. I invite the mayor mm. I invite the mayor to draw upon all the resources that are already there and for there to be collaboration I have why have 50 groups doing the same thing when you could have a strong task force, organized, effective, working together to go and address issues in school, community issues, school issues, work together? I, I, I just saw it a while ago, and, and this is it. There, there need to be this coordinated um, task force. There need to be this pulling in all the different facets and having them, you know, it's like a, a, a genogram, you know, having everything all linked in together. I, I think if I was a mayor, if the mayor was smart, pull all these people together and say, right, we are going to take back our city. I don't see that message going out, um, Stephen. No. I, see, I see political shows, when I say political show, a showmanship to say, we're having summit. <laughs> Unfortunately, I use that word as well, but everybody's having summit. And then some, they have having summit there. But I believe what you said a while ago, and that is what we should say, and I believe that is something that I should do a press release from, if anything, to say the mayor needs to take the lead in coordinating a task force, pulling all the facets of all the groups together, and with one message saying, we want to, we are, not we want to, we're taking back our city. Yeah. We're taking back the neighborhood. Yeah. We're taking back yeah. that inner city. You know, we're taking back that council estate. You know what? I'm a neighborhood watch coordinator. And I say this all the while. On my street now, if anything happens, I might get a little thing, you know, uh, oh, we see this strange guy walking down. Are we, are we also, okay, whatever. And we, we, we've got a messenger group. We've got a WhatsApp group. And we know what's going down on the street. Well, actually, we have a street party tomorrow. <laughs> You're going to see some Facebook Live. We've got a street party together as a way of actually pulling people together on the street. I believe in neighbors like these inner city areas, these hubs, 
which can have maybe 200, 200 families together, come together with a neighborhood watch strategy. And trust me, children knowing their neighbors, people getting to know each other, the community. God, that, put it this way, that's a community within itself right there, within a, a, a close-knit inner city high-rise. That's a community there. Yeah. And that's how it should be. Yeah. And, you know, it, it goes to, um, as you say, the right people being empowered to reach the levels that the mayor ordinarily with political uh, machines cannot reach to address the issues that really need addressing. And I tell you that because I've been in the presence of so many of these young people who have all the bravado. And when you get them on their own, the first thing that I'm struck by invariably is the intellect, the level of intellect that these boys have. And I'm thinking to myself, if I was your dad, if I was your father, I would steer you in a way where you could actually reach the greatness that lies within you. Yes. Um, because it's so obvious to me, these are bright young boys, but somewhere along the line, they've not had the validation of the family or yes. they have been failed in school or they just have a, a lack of uh, aspiration because of maybe a lack of self-belief. And that's been replaced by the love of making quick money, uh, being influenced by those who are more sophisticated than them, leading them down the path of criminal activity until they then find themselves in a courtroom. And by then it's too late. You know, doing the job I do, yes, I will argue for you. I will try and put your case. But ultimately, as I ask each and every one of them, why would you want to put your life literally in the hands of 12 people who never met you and 12 people who may never have interacted with a young black male, apart from what they read on the news in the newspapers and on the television screen, and so when they do that and they see feral behavior, such as what we've seen in Camberwell and other places, when in court, that's why it takes less than four hours. Mm. Because as far as they're concerned, you're all in that kind of lifestyle. Even if you didn't have the knife, even if you weren't the person who stabbed, the law of joint enterprise, which is the direction that's given by the judge, that says if you were there and you assisted or encouraged, or you knew so-and-so had a knife and you didn't absent yourself from the proceedings, you are as guilty as the person who entered or used the knife to plunge into another human being's body. Until that message gets across, young people are going to think it's cool to run with the bad man dem, as they call them, yes, to yes. do X, Y, and Z. But I'm telling you, and the message goes out tonight to people, I'm in court, I get to see what happens on the other side, the bits you don't see after you've read it on the newspaper, in the newspaper, on the television. I get to see these young boys on remand, the laughing and the joking and the bravado and the messing around. And as the day approaches for trial, the nerves, the sweaty palms, the beads of sweat on their foreheads, yes. the look of a, the longing look that they give the jury, almost begging them to find them not guilty, yeah. the sitting through of the evidence as witnesses are called, police officers giving evidence, the deceased parents or mother saying how she loved her son, but she'll never get to touch him again. Mm. I get to see all of that. Going down at lunchtime to see the defendants and they're asking, is the case going okay? Is it going okay? I get to see them when the jury come back into the courtroom and there's absolute silence. And the judge asks the jury foreman, have you reached a verdict upon which all, all of you agreed? And the tension in that courtroom, when the person stands up and says guilty, that person, those 12, have just taken your teenage years, your formative years, the years when you're going to have, should have been doing GCSEs or that apprenticeship, the years when you maybe should have met that girl that you were going to marry, that holiday that you should have taken with your family, the holiday snaps the Christmases, the birthdays, but they're all replaced by visiting orders being sent out once a month or once every two weeks to go and see your son or your relative incarcerated, getting involved in fights in prison, 
their mental health, their mental well-being. I get to see all of that. And that's the reality of what we're talking about. Mm. The parents who have to go to the morgue to identify their child. The post-mortem photos of a young person's body cut up into pieces as the pathologist tries to find out how they died. Mm. And then the parent going to the graveside to put their child in the ground, thinking 15 years ago, I was in a hospital when I took that bundle of joy home and it was the celebration of all our family. Mm. Only fast forward 15 years and I'm putting that body into the ground, an unfulfilled potential. Is that why God put them on this planet to die at 15? Mm. That's the reality, Silborn. That's the reality. And that's why sometimes I'm not ashamed to come home and tell you that I shed a tear as I'm almost crying now, as I relive their moments and I look at my own children and say, but for the grace of God, there go I. Because that's my reality. The mental torment of having to represent young people, youngsters, the age of my son, who should be thinking about aspiration, future, holidays, all of those things. And they're either dead or they're, all, or, or they're serving time in prison. Yeah. That's the reality, Silver. Wow. Wow. Well, uh, Stephen, um, there's not much more I can say now, you know what I'm saying? Um, the, the, uh, I've been sharing this video as much as possible, and, and, and I want people to really share this video. Um, I've heard Stephen talk about this a few times, and each time he talks about it, it's so real, and it gets a bit more deep. Yeah? And the, the message is not going through, Stephen. The message is not going through. It's not coming true to the people, really. And once people get to understand this, and young people get to understand this, then maybe we're at a turning curve. But as we say, we must own the problem first. And uh, the schoolwork and the mentoring and going there, this message, like what you're saying, needs to be heard because they think it's cool, Stephen. That's the thing. They think it's cool until the reality hits. And when that reality hits and they're going down that precipice of either death or prison then they are in this precipice of failure because the system is not going to support them after the NNCRB and all those sort of things it's doom gloom you know yeah you remember Silbon that that thing that happened in Camberwell re just recently yeah witnesses said they could hear the boy on the floor screaming yes help me help me because I guarantee you, no human being that I know, unless they're terminally ill and they want to die, wants to die. Mm. No one. Mm. Let alone a 15-year-old child who but a week ago may have been playing or enjoying time mm. with friends. And yeah. he's lying there on the floor knowing that his hour might be up. And he's screaming, help me. No one wants to die. So why die prematurely? Yeah. The, 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 next, the, the, the next type of person that I, I really want to talk to is the trauma surgeon. You know, the, the, we, we, are, we are seeing it most times from the it's distance to us. Oh, five person got dead. Two person got stabbed. It's not close to us, you know, until someone who is close to those realities can actually shed a light. I, I say to person sometimes, why am I doing this? I, I, I'm not affected directly, but I took hold of this message. We must own the problem. And that's why I elaborated on what you said, the we must. I know we understand it is because you and I, we have discussed it already, but we wanted to get that message out the we, and I consider myself a part of the we, even though I'm not directly affected. But then, in, in a sense, I am directly affected. We are directly affected because it, 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 it affects how people look at us as a people, as a race, as well. That we're not serious. You know, the, the comparisons are made with the Asians, the Chinese, the Jews. You know, why is, why is it happening to us? Uh, many black people will say sometimes, are we cursed? Those are things which are being said already. The racism, the, the vitriol, and all those sort of things which are happening. 
and and the work of the the great, you know, the Marcus Garvey, uh, th these messages, Julius Nero, all these persons who have gone through this journey, gone through this pathway to elevate the Martin Luther Kings. It seems like it's all not because what they did and what they stand for somehow is not resonating. So you know what, Stephen? It is incumbent upon you and me and all of us and persons who get the message that we are all affected, as Pauline Gale just said, and we must own the problem first. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know, Stephen, I don't think there's much more I can say <laughs> at this point, you know. Um, but, but one thing I want to come out of this, though, Stephen, is um, even from the Solution Oriented Summit, I need us to pen, you and myself, or whoever, to pen a letter to the mayor that he need to call upon all the, the players, all the stakeholders, even there have been bad blood, because there was some bad blood with Boris and some issues with uh, different persons working together on this whole issue. But they've got to come together like a genogram and have an action plan to take back the city. You know, um, Scotland is a good template, which has been there before, you know, and, and, and use this. New York has shown where they got the zero tolerance. Pick the good and the bad. If it is for uh, a more structured and more responsible stop and search, if that is to be, that is to be. And forget about the naysayers. Just do what you have to do, man. <laughs> it's better to stop and search somebody wrongly than to miss out that person with a knife that go and stab and disboil another man, another child. That's my view. Yeah. Well, in any progress, there is pain. And yes. for me, there needs to be uh, some serious, serious steps forward in terms of not being scared to address those issues, confront them face on, seeking help from those who can really give the help, and to deal with it on a humane level and not seek to score cheap political points yes. or to come up flimsy arguments why stuff cannot be done. Yeah, Something can be done and it must be done and it must be done by the right people with the right sentiment to make it who want to see this stop. Yeah. And if you are, if you want to write a letter to the mayor, then I will meet with you and we will write a letter to the mayor and we will ask for audience with the mayor. Yeah. Because it requires positive, direct steps yes talk has always been cheap will always be cheap but yeah. action is what is required yes i just want to go through a couple um persons here and aldora moore says hi silver in a public health issue yes and we don't know when someone that we're close to might be afflicted indeed young persons who i minded as a baby was killed about a year ago now i'm felt extremely hurt and mourned with the family. Pauline Gale said, we are all affected. Leslie Mbarra has said, this needs to be on Snapchat and the areas of social media that young people use. We need this message to get through. It's a serious message. Pauline Gale, this serious information should be displayed on posters, leaflets, social media. Stephen, what, what are we going to do, Stephen? Um, we're going to do some videos and we're going to get you to do some five minutes blip, one minute blip on something like that, you know? Something to actually, as someone said, put them on Snapchat. Put it, do it a way where, you know, unfortunately, people's span of com of concentration is so short. They got to be so quick these days. You can't go for oh, ten minutes. You go for like one minute or something. Bang, bang, bang. You know, you know, uh, something like, do you know there's twelve persons that you never know in your life? They don't even look like you. Can determine your destiny of years in jail, never see them before. And that can be by simple an association. That is with the joint enterprise there, right there, you know? So we have to do some good Snapchat, some good, um, I don't know, I'm gonna put this out there. If there's any writers out there, somebody out there that can put some good one-liners together, some quick thing, um, 
and Stephen, and, and we do these little videos, Stephen, because I realize that we've got to get into the mind and the psyche of the young people. And I don't believe, I don't believe that I've got to wear baggy trousers. I don't believe that I've got to take off a suit. I just believe that I've got to be real. <laughs> you know? That's right. You know? You've got to be knowledge, real. Knowledge is always been power. Knowledge yeah. has always been power. And when you're ignorant of it, you have a problem. And I'm afraid a lot of these youngsters and even some of their families do not understand the dynamics of what happens when you enter that courtroom. And invariably, in London, a lot of these young boys who are involved in this lifestyle, who end up committing murder, end up at the Old Bailey, the most mm -hmm. notorious court in the land. And you don't go there for small offences. You go there for serious offences, with serious judges, with the best prosecutors in the country. With, and you place your life in the court's hands. Yes. You place your life in the hands of the jury. Mm. And a lot of people don't understand that dynamic till they're in it. And then yeah. they're wishing and hoping and talking in tongues and praying. But mm. it's too late. If you weren't involved, you wouldn't be there. Yes. And the kids need to understand that. They need yeah. to understand what joint enterprise means. It's a buzzword on the streets. But legally, do you understand what it means? Yes. That if you see your friend pull out a knife, and you are still there when he decides he's going to stick it into another human being. And witnesses say that they saw you there and you made no attempt to run. And that you were within four feet of him. And you, the jury are asked to infer by the prosecution that you were there encouraging him, supporting him, lending your support to the commission of that offense. Then you leave yourself at the mercy of the jury to say guilty of murder on the basis of joint enterprise, even where there was no intention to kill. And you leave yourself liable to the same sentence as the person who inflicted the fatal stab wound. That's the reality. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, you know, guilty by association of Paul again. Well, Stephen, listen, um, we wrap up to now and I, I'll do my, my, my summing up. But I want to thank you so much, Stephen, um, for You're coming welcome. on and the great work you're doing. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that we, we partner with this whole project. Uh, but any last word you want to share to people who are listening there or any, because I'm, I'm going to be putting this video on YouTube as well. And I'm going to be um, keep sharing it with the, the level of information which is there um, so people can actually watch it. You know, I think it's important that people watch it as well. Any last words, Stephen? Those people out there with young people, remember that feeling that you had when that child was born, the elation, the happiness, the joy, the thoughts of what they might become and who they might be, and the, proud, the pride you would have of that child, in that child. You want to think about that when you don't know where your child is, or you're not, in, 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 you're not inflicting or perhaps that's not the right word. You're not exercising the discipline that you need to as a parent. You're the parent first and not their friend. Yes. Decisions you're going to have to take are sometimes tough, but you're preserving them. You're protecting them. Because I want, more than anything, for you to have that same joy that you had the day they were born and not to have sadness when you're either visiting them in prison. As I spoke to a mother today, whose son's serving 16 years in prison, yes. or having to go to the cemetery to talk to them. When you have that in your mind as a parent, single or otherwise, you're going to get in your children's business and you're going to want to know where they are, who they are, who they're associating with. You're going to take more time with them. Yes. Young people, friends of yours who've been killed or are in prison, those in prison might tell you it's all right and it's a breeze and it's no big thing, but it's a lie. It's a myth because nobody wants to spend 14 years in prison. You don't want to have the mental torment of not seeing the friend again who's been already been killed and you don't want the same thing to happen to you. Yes, yes. There used to be a saying back in the day, 
you check yourself before you wreck yourself. Yes, yes. Think, think before you act and before you engage and you'll save yourself a lifetime of pain. Powerful, powerful. Okay. On this episode of the well, Stephen, um, thank you so much for coming and um, and have a, have a wonderful evening. And uh, thank you, sir. You know, all we can say, um, God rest the souls of those young people who have passed away. And uh, amen. You know, their graves. Their graves are graves whereby sometimes you can say, and their lies dreams which have not been realized i can imagine you know you can imagine some of these some of these parents had the dreams they had those dreams you know because parents dream sometimes is transferred into children and they, they build that dream you know and the parent or they will know that and then the children tend to realize their dreams and then they start to build on that dream and and have that aspiration and then that is snuffed out and and then on the grave he says there lies another dream, which is dead. Yeah. Stephen, yeah. listen, all the best, and uh, we'll talk. Have a good Thank you very much. Take and care. I, guess, I guess you're very good now at Facebook Live with the split screen now after all that practice today. <laughs> yeah, I've, got, I've, I've got my diploma now. <laughs> you got the diploma now. Okay. I hope I know to okay. finish this thing. Um, uh, Stephen, if you log out, because I, I think, I think, I think this, this, the way I did this today is a new way. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, as if you, if you can log out of this, or if I can log out of this, I don't know how to do that. Uh, yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, um, Stephen, uh, oh yeah, Stephen is gone now. Yeah, uh, I want to thank you so much for for coming on tonight, and uh, you know, it was a very challenging um, discussion tonight, and. You know, one one of the things that I I really want to come out of this tonight is the whole issue which I talked about, um, getting a letter to the mayor and talking about organizations working and coming together. I I think that is something which is powerful. I think that is something that do need to happen, and I think it is something which is a part of the a part of the action action station. I believe that's a part of the action station that need to take place because so long um, everything it's like a deja vu and when I say a deja vu it is like we have been there before we have talked about it before but it's got to go to the next level I believe that what needs to happen now there need to be some fundamental leadership in the area there's no more need for another summit there's no need for another getting together of big stakeholders but now is the time to with the the powers that be and all those organizations all those organizations which are out there doing work in the community they are doing fantastic work in the community sometimes they they are cheesed off they are not um, recognized but they are the ones who are engaging with these young people so therefore there need to be a, a message to the mayor there need to be a message which is saying that Miss Mayor you need to come together with the people and to lead from the front it doesn't matter what political persuasion um, labor conservative or whatever but it's a crisis it's an epidemic now at the same time and what we don't want it is for it to get worse and that's why a person like see we're gonna get something to the mayor to say pull together pull together Pull together and every person at the sound of my voice it's important that you own the problem we own this issue which is the atrocities between knife and gun crime it may not be you today with your family being affected or even directly but it may be tomorrow and your action today may save lives many lives and even those close to your life as well um, what came out of it as well get the right people around going into the schools mentoring the young people uh coordinating the task force yeah and i put a, a sos out there for persons who want to draft some little script that's Stephen especially we can put together and do some video clips 
the one minute video clip or so that can go on snapchat as somebody said cherry johnson who came on the show and spoke about um counter lines and social media what she said is that parents you need to know snapchat you need to know instagram you need to be a friend don't separate yourself away from that you need to know about it how it is done and work it right because that's where the children are that's the community remember you know a community is raised a community raise a child but where the community now is uh, unfortunately the community a lot is on social media clue that means to say you've got to get a part of that community as well ladies and gentlemen my name is silver and and i approve this message i approve this show and um please share this share this video it's important that you share this video no matter how long it is we need to just listen as much as possible stephen said so many powerful things powerful please like and subscribe the silver and tv show like and subscribe me on on youtube i'm going to put this up on youtube um i'm going to put it on um link on instagram uh whatsapp uh and also on twitter okay peace out all the best. Cheers.